Hello and um, welcome. It's a beautiful sunny day. Thank you for uh, coming inside. We don't get enough of those in Ottawa. Um, Norway and Canada have a lot in common. We're both northern countries. Uh, we're both countries for whom oil and gas makes up a big mix of our economy. They like cross-country skiing and bobsled. We like hockey. There are some differences, but we have many similarities between the two of us as well. But in many ways, the similarities end there. Um, Norway has taken the wealth from its oil and put almost all of it aside for the future. Norway has imposed one of the world's first carbon taxes and one of the highest carbon taxes on its oil and gas industry uh, and invested heavily in promoting um, low carbon development both at home and around the world. For us, there are potentially some really interesting lessons in Canada um, from how those experiments have worked out in Norway. Uh, as people will know, um, issues around how we manage our oil, both the economic and the environmental side, have been forefront in the Canadian political debate in the last few months. Uh, governments in Alberta and even federally have seen their budget projections plummet rapidly in the face of dropping oil prices. Uh, there's a real debate in Canada about how do we fund future pension fund liabilities. There have been constant debates, particularly in this city, about whether or not we can put a price on oil and gas, a carbon price on oil and gas production without killing the industry. Norway's done all those things, and there could be no better person to tell us about how they've worked out than Kristin Halverson, and I apologize for not pronouncing your name correctly, inevitably, but <laughs> um, she was finance minister of Norway from 2005 to 2009, so she oversaw both the carbon tax and the sovereign wealth fund. Uh, she was deputy leader of the Socialist Party in a coalition government in which she was prime minister, uh, deputy prime minister, sorry, I almost gave you a promotion there. Um, she was Minister of Education for the subsequent four years and then stepped down from politics a little over a year ago and is now the head of Cicero, which is a globally respected climate research institute in Norway. So without further ado, we're very fortunate to have Kristen Halverson today to talk to us a little bit about Norway's experience with carbon pricing, oil and sustainability. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me to Ottawa. Uh, I've been here before, but um, I think it's, uh, I, I hope that I will both interest you and inspire you by telling you some more about the Norwegian uh, World Sovereign Wealth Fund and the carbon tax. Uh, I'm not uh, a researcher or a scientist myself. Um, I'm not even an academic. Uh, I quit my studies when I was elected to the Norwegian parliament in 89, and I never returned. That is not to inspire any of the students <laughs> here today. Uh, but my experience is, of course, from, uh, from politics for 24 years. And I've uh, been in the front line in defending uh, CO2 taxes in introducing new carbon taxes in, and in trying to explain to the Norwegian public why we can't spend all the revenues from the oil and gas sector in a year or two. Um, <clears throat> so let me start by telling you something about the government pension fund global. Uh, oil was discovered in, or in the Norwegian uh, sector of the continental shelf in 1969 and the production started in 71. It took about 10 years before the government revenues became substantial. And in 2012, Norway was ranked as the sixth largest exporter of gas and the 14th largest ex exporter of oil. Petroleum accounts for around 20% of the size of the Norwegian economy, around 30% of the state's revenue, and above half of the Norwegian exports. So in fact, we are a more oil dependent country than Canada. Uh, for many countries, uh, uh, resource wealth seems to be a curse rather than a blessing. And many countries that are rich in resources perform quite badly when it comes to economic uh, growth. Uh, in Norway, we managed to uh, our wealth quite well, I think. We've avoided many of the traps which other resource-rich countries fell, uh, easily have fell into. 
the first installment in the fund was made in 1996. Today, the fund is considered one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world. We've grown from zero to around a trillion Canadian uh, dollars in 18 years. Our pension fund is not the one and only model and will not suit all, but I hope it can be an interesting story to tell you. Just a minute, I tried to cut this manuscript down. If you wave to me when I've used 30 minutes or something, then I can, yeah. Uh, the aims of the fund are twofold. Firstly, we wanted a mechanism ensuring that the petroleum wealth benefits both current and future generations. And secondly, we wanted to shelter the domestic economy from overheating due to oil financed demand. Um, the, um, the value of the fund currently corresponds to about two and a half times the mainland GDP and close to 54% of the fund is due to the net inflow of oil revenues, while 36% due to returns on the investments and the rest is currency fluctuations. All the state petroleum revenues, including revenues from taxes, um, the oil and gas sector is heavily taxed in, in Norway by 78%, but also the CO2 taxes from the offshore activity are transferred to the fund and invested abroad. This helps shelter the domestic economy and the exchange rate from the volatility of petroleum revenues. The government should spend no more than the real rate of return of the fund in order to preserve its real value for future generations. While the capital in the fund may be spent only once, the real return enables a permanently high level of government expenditure over time. And the real return is estimated at 4%. The spending rule, this is our spending rule, it guides how much the government should use of this return depending on the prevailing economic conditions. So that means that in periods of high economic growth, spending is less than the long-term target of 4%, and in periods of economic downturn, spending exceeds the long-term targets of 4%. Uh, so for instance, during the financial crisis, we had muscles to fight unemployment, uh, and we have the lowest unemployment rate in Europe. So this is how Keynes would you know, tell us to do it. The rule supports a stable economic development by allowing for a gradual increase in, this, in the spending. And there is no direct earmarking of petroleum income for specific spending uh, purposes. It's named the pension fund. That is the narrative, <laughs> makes it easier to explain to the Norwegian public why it's so important that we save uh, a lot of the revenues from the oil and gas sector because of the demographic, demographic uh, uh, yeah, situation, we will grow older uh, in Norway and we have a pay-as-you-go pay pension system. So that is of uh, importance. But it's not earmarked, and people know that, but it's a nice story. So the fund has become an important source for funding of gov government expenditures. And in 2015, the transfers from the fund will, co will cover 11% of the total budget expenses. But that is less than 4% of the real return of the fund, estimated 4%. So it, it's, uh, it's really uh, an important part of, uh, of our uh, income. Uh, I can tell you something more about how the fund is managed. Uh, but I'll come back to you if you ask me to do so, because that is a bit technical. But uh, the short story is that it's, uh, it's discussed every year in Parliament uh, how the, the fund should be managed, if there are going to be some changes when it comes to risk. Uh, it is managed day by day by Norges Bank or the national, Norwegian National uh, Bank. 
and the Minister of Finance, they make the framework. But it's not, it's, you can't call the Minister of Finance in Norway and ask her to invest in a specific company. You could try, but you, you won't get a, get a positive uh, answer. Um, so let me tell you something about uh, what the fund is investing in. Um, the fund is different from the average uh, investor. Uh, it's large. It has a very long uh, investment horizon. It has few needs of uh, liquidity, and it's government-owned. And these characteristics influence its risk-taking uh, capability and may give advantages in certain areas compared to other uh, investors. The overarching objective for the investments is to achieve the maximum possible return given the moderate uh, level of risk. So it's not an instrument for achieving foreign policy goals. The fund investments are widely diversified across regions, countries and sectors in order to reduce risk. At year end in 2014, investments were spread across 20, 75 different countries, 47 currencies, and in excess of 9,000 different companies and more than 1,000 individual issuers. The asset allocation is well diversified with 60% in equities, up to 5% in real estate, and the rest uh, in bonds. Uh, we have had developed ethical guidelines connected to the fund, and I was among those members of the Norwegian Parliament that first suggested that there should be established ethical guidelines for the fund. And at first that was a controversial political issue. But we could prove that the fund uh, was investing in, for instance, nuclear weapons or landmines, and there was a growing public opinion in support of these ethical uh, guidelines. And the first ethical guidelines came into force in 2004 uh, after a comprehensive public uh, hearing. So there are several instruments to promote the fund's role as a responsible financial investor. Exclusion of companies is one of these uh, instruments. So companies shall be excluded from the government pension fund if they produce certain products or sell weapons to specific states, and companies may also be excluded if there is an unacceptable risk that they contribute to or are responsible for grossly unethical activities, including uh, serious or systematic human rights violations or gross uh, corruptions. Currently, the discussion is uh, going on in Norway when it comes to how the fund should take a more active stance on combating climate change. So the global divestment movement has an impact in Norway as well, and NGOs and several members of the parliament have argued that the fund should divest from companies engaged in coal production. Some would also like to exclude oil and gas companies. And as the director of CISRO, that is a bit double standard when all the revenues come from the oil and gas sector, but uh, I can explain why it could be <laughs> interesting. Because when you are that developed of revenues from oil and gas, and in addition, invest in a lot of oil and gas companies, then you put the fund at risk. Uh, so there is, um, it's, in fact, it, uh, it, it's a very important uh, discussion. But double standard, of course. Um, there are multiple challenges connected to how, how the climate investment strategy for the fund should de develop. Uh, first, um, of course, our economy is too much dependent on the oil and gas industry and uh, from the revenues from this uh, sector. But it also has consequences for the investment strategy for the fund because now it's heavily invested in fossil assets. And this might become risky business when fossil fuels will be abandoned. So we need to prove and understand the um, uh, climate risk. And I know that the fund and the management of the fund 
are working on that and trying to combine the knowledge from climate with the knowledge from the uh, financial sector, because this is a, a very important uh, issue. And then secondly, at the same time, there is a great need for investments in renewables, especially in developing countries. The fund can contribute to climate finance by increasing investments in renewables and be active in developing new climate-friendly investment instruments, such as, for instance, green bonds. CISRA, we, we, issue, we don't issue green bond, but we issue second opinion connected to green bonds to see how green they are. So this is, and this is in fact a big, major question also uh, on the pathway to Paris, in Paris and beyond Paris. And of course, the world's largest uh, sovereign wealth fund could be a very important player in developing these new needed instruments. Um, yeah, there will be introduced a new exclusion criterion, contribution to climate change. And the Norwegian parliament last week decided to exclude investments in coal-fired power plants and companies which gets more than 30% of their revenues from coal-based activities. And reasoning for this, the parliament mentioned that coal clearly contributes directly to climate change, but also has, that coal has become a risky asset to uh, invest in. So I believe it's a good idea to exclude investment based on coal-based activities from the fund and to add contribution to climate change as the new ethical criterion. When such a new climate criterion will be introduced, the fund should exclude not only coal uh, assets, but also probably oil sand. Uh, <clears throat> but, that, but that is in a separate ethical com uh, committee going, looking into that uh, question, and they have to set some standards. But my guess and expectation will be that the Norwegian pension fund also will divest from uh, oil sand. So I think it's going to be a, quite an interesting uh, discussion. Um, yes, because it's hard to argue that these do not directly contribute to climate change. So that is the Norwegian example when it comes to sovereign wealth fund. And you can compare it to other funds that you know of. I'm just giving an inspiration. I think that we managed uh, quite well, and it is in fact possible to explain people why it's why why we have to uh, use the revenues from the oil and gas sector in a long-term uh, perspective. Uh, it wasn't that easy when the fund had great losses during the financial crisis because we were so heavily into yeah you know all these instruments that um, were affected. So let me tell you something about the Norwegian carbon taxes. 25 years ago, a social democratic prime minister, that was Guru Harlem Brundtland, she proposed to introduce a carbon tax on CO2 emissions from offshore oil and gas fields. But then she lost the election. So in fact, one year later, the tax was officially introduced by her successor from the Conservative Party, Mr. Sisse. He is not that famous around the world, but in Norway he is very famous for officially introducing the CO2 taxes. So together with Finland and Norway, we were among the first in the world to put a price on carbon. And this is not a controversial issue in Norway now. In fact, the Labour Party and the Conservatives are competing in taking the honour of introducing it and, you know, to be the modern in the forefront, globally leading, and so on. So there is not um, much discussion uh, about this. So tax to the carbon tax. Norwegian oil and gas rank most, among the most environmentally friendly oil and gas sector in the world. And uh, I just spoke to a friend of mine who's working in Statoil, and try, please give me the, the uh, well, 
the honest story about this because I'm in Canada. I need I need to be honest. Uh, well, I need to be honest everywhere. I'm sorry. <laughs> But I know that you, you, you are especially, especially interested in this topic. So they, they tell the following story. The first 10 years, the effect of the carbon tax was very uh, strong. It stopped flaring uh, in the, the North Sea. All of our, our oil and gas fields are uh, offshore. And it um, increased innovation connected to reduction of, uh, of emissions connected to the oil and gas uh, sector. It was very efficient. But then the effect was not taken out of it, but it wasn't that much more to, um, to develop. Uh, but it's still the fact that we, are, uh, we have among the world's most uh, environmental friendly oil and gas sector because of this tax. So let me say something about the size of the tax. It is about 70 uh, Canadian dollars per ton. Uh, we have, yeah. and it's, um, I think it's a broad agreement in Norway that the tax has, um, uh, that the effect of the tax is that both the Norwegian petroleum industry itself and the suppliers, because that is also a big industry in Norway have been quicker and better than other to, de to, to develop less polluting uh, te technologies. And for instance, in, already in 1996, at the Schleipne field, that um, a big project was set up to capture and store CO2 in the sandstone under the North Sea. And currently, a lot more is done to reduce methane emissions from the oil and gas uh, fields. It's not only the petroleum industry that pays a carbon tax, but as much as 80% of Norway's greenhouse gas emissions are uh, subject to carbon pricing through a carbon tax or through the European Union emission trading system, or both. And this system cover, uh, covers several greenhouse gases, not only uh, CO2. We are now a member of the UETS uh, system, the world's largest emiss, uh, emission trading system. But the price on the allowances in the system is very low. So we kept when, when the Norwegian gas, oil and gas industry um, had to be part of this cap and trade uh, system, we kept the CO2 tax um, at a bit less uh, level, but, <coughs> but uh, not to reduce the cost on uh, uh, carbon emissions. Uh, yeah, so we know the effect of this, um, of this introduction of the CO2 um, tax. We know that uh, the tax is um, in, in the EU system is not that uh, effective. But we know that it's, uh, it's possible to see positive uh, results. So, well, just a few minutes ago, I told you that there was this broad Norwegian consensus about the carbon tax. And that is the fact when it comes to the carbon tax connected to the offshore sector. But let me tell you that it's not been, you know, always an easy job to introduce new taxes when it comes to taxes at all, and especially not green uh, taxes. But we have had several um, <coughs> official commissions that have, have suggested different ways of shifting from income taxes or business taxes to green uh, taxes. And in fact, our current conservative government, they've just mandated another commission to elaborate new uh, measures and to prepare for a new uh, reform. So this is, it, uh, is an interesting uh, topic for all political parties uh, in uh, Norway. Uh, we know that <coughs> uh, the public acceptance of environmental taxes um, uh, on the offshore petroleum production has been rev uh, relatively high. 
but let me tell you that it was not very easy to suggest how we should change taxation of cars, petrol, diesel in Norway. Uh, our go when I was serving as a finance minister, the government suggested a package. It was like a package, but part of that package was to raise the CO2 uh, tax on car, petrol, and diesel. The T euro, that is less than two Canadian dollar cents. So it was very, a very small raise. And it led to big protests. Trucks blocked the roads to our capital in, pro in protest to our plants. But we did push it through, and we added some other uh, measures that really have had a great uh, effect. Uh, and that uh, is effective because it's connected to the tax on the, uh, when you buy a car. That is a, quite a high fiscal tax connected to buying cars in Norway. That had, had a fiscal reason, but we changed it. So <clears throat> it, we made it cheaper for less polluting cars, and those who buy an electric car pay no taxes at all. So this tax rebate, in combination with the taxation on petrol, has contributed to a drastic reduction of emissions from car in Norway over the last years. Uh, emissions from the total of new cars sold in Norway from 2008 to 2013 has gone down with 40%. So that has been a major uh, reduction. And part of that story is that Norway has more electric cars per capita than any other country. So Norway stood for 31% of all electric cars that were sold in Europe last year. And thanks to our environmental taxes and the big demand for electric cars, we have created an interesting market for electric car producers. And in this way, our little country, we are 5 million people, uh, contributes to the further development of the global market for electric cars and the rapid progress in the technologies and batteries can also spur the development of electric uh, construction machinery and buses. And that is a fact, even if it was this, you know, very noisy, a lot of protests. I think most Norwegians now are quite proud that we had these changes in just a few years and that we are a leading nation when it comes to, in, uh, to having uh, electric cars. So let me uh, conclude. Um, of course, the most effective measure for reducing greenhouse gas emissions would be global carbon pricing. All researchers agree on this and most political, uh, politicians know it. Putting a price on carbon across the globe is, however, not a likely outcome of the Paris climate negotiations later this year, nor is it within reaching in the coming years. But the growing number of countries and regions are, however, introducing carbon pricing measures. According to the World Bank, almost 40 countries and more than 20 cities states and provinces already use carbon pricing mechanisms or are planning to implement them. And these uh, areas are responsible for more than 22% of global uh, emissions. Others are developing or considering systems that will put a price on carbon in the future. And altogether, these actions will encompass almost half of the global CO2 uh, emissions. Uh, so, we know that uh, where carbon pricing measures are in vigor, emissions do go down and carbon pricing do work. And also private sector support is growing. Many companies operate in countries that have carbon pricing systems in place now and they are developing the expertise in both managing their emissions and incorporating a real or a shadow carbon price in their planning and investments. We have companies coming to us to ask us uh, and, and to, to give them advice when it comes to how they can, can work with a shadow carbon price to prepare for a new uh, international um, deal on carbon pricing. 
So this brings me to my conclusion. Countries that are among the first to introduce carbon pricing will have a comparative advantage over the laggards as business in the forward-leaning countries will sooner make the transition to a low-carbon economy. In the long run, this will be a triple win for business, for the country as a whole, and for the global climate. Thank you very much. victim of uh, Norway envy, um, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm hoping more people in our country are. Uh, would you tell us which Canadian companies your sovereign fund invests in? Um, you know? Uh, I, I can look it up. It's, yeah. uh, no, I'm just curious, you know. No. Uh, then I have to, I think that it is, uh, if you go to the web pages of uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, I think they report it every year or something. But it is 9,000 companies oh. throughout the world. So, and, <clears throat> and we are not going to invest uh, or to, uh, we, we are investing, I think it's one um, point three percent in average in each and every company. That is to spread the risk. So we won't be, you know, a major owner in any of your companies. Just a, just a related question. Are you a, an active shareholder? Do you, do you take positions on, on, let's say, CEO salaries, that sort of thing? Yeah, we are, <clears throat> uh, we are active contacting other owners. Uh, um, and in uh, um, the general meetings of the companies, but we are not um, taking positions in, in the boards or holding positions, I'm sorry. Um, I found your presentation really interesting and I was so inspired to see some of the examples around, for example, the way Norway has been talking about using its uh, energy revenues to fund investments in renewables and that's a discussion I think we haven't had in Canada to have the electric vehicle initiatives very impressive a lot of impressive things uh, looking online just to get some numbers looked at the European Environment Agency data and Norway's greenhouse gas emissions went up 5.8% uh, from 1990 to 2011 despite carbon pricing um, looked at the climate action tracker website which ranks countries gave Norway a medium grade not terrible not great mm. but that's right. points out that Norway's actions are not consistent with the world being mm. on track to it avoiding two degrees Celsius of warming. So is it fair to say, just in terms of how we look at it from a Canadian perspective, that Norway certainly gives a, a better example of how an oil producer can respond to climate change, but doesn't yet offer a successful example from an environmental perspective mm. of being on track to doing what needs to be yeah. done in terms of carbon reduction? Yeah, well, it's, it's hard for an oil and gas producing country to be the leading nation when it comes to climate issues. That is, that is the fact. But we can do the best of it, and I think that we've tried to do uh, the best of it. But the next discussion in Norway is the fact that the IPCC assessment report tells us that two-thirds of the known resources uh, connected to fossil um, uh, coal, oil, and gas has to uh, stay in the ground, not being exploited, if we are going to stick to the two-degree target. 
And that means that we have to, um, to uh, well, to stop opening new uh, fields and to um, transform our economy from a fossil-based uh, economy and into a renewable economy. So that is, that is an ongoing discussion in Norway. It's a really important uh, discussion. Maureen Irish from the University of Windsor. I noted in the description of the panel that it, it talks about a tax being imposed uh, on uh, Norwegian production with a higher tax on uh, trading partners. And I wondered about this issue of border tax adjustments that comes up all the time when uh, countries are talking about a carbon tax or uh, a cap-and-trade system. Uh, did anyone worry about uh, illegality under the WTO? And if so, uh, is there likely to be some discussion of potential waivers under the uh, WTO that might be needed if these taxes are to go ahead and if there are to be uh, border taxes uh, in order to make carbon taxing uh, politically acceptable. I don't know if my question is clear, but there, yeah. there are some trade I issues. I think I need maybe an explanation. Yeah, there may have been um, either a typo in the program um, or, or you, you misread it. It should say a higher price than trading partners as opposed to on. Oh, so and it says on. Say, it actually does say on. Is that not the typo? Uh, you know, okay. Okay, I, I may have misread the yeah. uh, description. Uh, so was the tax imposed without a, uh, a border tax adjustment for any imports? Yeah, it, the, the border tax adjustment has not been a big uh, question, but um, uh, the um, competition between countries and regions and parts of the world uh, not so much connected to the oil and gas sector because the profit in this sector has been very high, uh, but to all other industries, um, that has been a big issue because we also have big resources connected to hydropower. Most of our electricity comes from hydropower. And for instance, uh, the aluminium industry uh, if, uh, would protest, say, okay, this is the most environmental friendly aluminium in the world because we use electricity based on hydropower when you, you produce it. So why should you tax us? Uh, because they have some, of course, uh, CO2 uh, emissions connected to the process. Um, so, and we have a quite a pragmatic dialogue with them, I, I say. So we found a way to balance for other uh, industries. Um, but um, I think that what is very important to, uh, to do when you are uh, trying to be ahead when it comes to carbon taxes is to be in a dialogue with industries and try to find um, how much it is, um, well, how taxes can encourage them to um, develop and innovate the way they produce and what they produce. And I think that we have been quite successful by doing that uh, in Norway. I'm not sure if the industry will tell the exactly the same story here, but yeah, it's important though. Thank you for your presentation. I'm a big fan of carbon taxes, so I applaud Norway's tax and um, management of the yeah, revenues from the oil industry. But I wanted to draw another parallel between um, Canada and Norway in that when we talk about emissions from the oil and gas industry, we're typically, almost always, only talking about the emissions within our own countries and not the much larger emissions that result from the carbon we're exporting. That's right. mm. and I'm wondering if you can um, comment on your Cicero colleague, Glenn Peters' work that yes. <laughs> shows that um, Norway is exporting 10 times more carbon um, than it is burning within. So sort of the efforts to reduce Norway's own emissions are swamped by 
the emissions that mm -hmm. Norway is contributing to, much like Canada mm -hmm. um, elsewhere around the world, and to what degree that uh, has come into play in political debates mm -hmm. in Norway. Yes, that's a very important perspective, and Glenn Peters is always, you know, making a lot of noise about that, or it's, it's a controversial uh, uh, fact. Uh, but of course, uh, that is part of the international discussion connected to uh, who is going to pay the tax, the consumer or the pr producer or both. Uh, but it's part of the story about how Norway contributes to uh, global warming. So uh, I think it's possible to, you know, to, to show that as a fact, our responsibility. And in the same time, when we come to discuss taxation, uh, we have an, a bit more another perspective. Yeah, so. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Really a terrific opportunity for us to hear, hear from you. Uh, on these issues from the Norwegian perspective. Uh, Tessa Hebb, Carleton University. My area of, um, of research and specialty is responsible investment. So I know the uh, Norwegian Pension Fund uh, and follow it closely as a, as a leader in responsible investment. And I've been very curious about, uh, as, as you know, uh, initially the um, the, the, the staff of the pension fund did not embrace the idea of divestment from fossil fuel, and it has been the, the legislature that has now come in, um, uh, particularly on coal. One of the arguments is that there isn't enough opportunities for, currently for investment in renewables uh, to offset that, uh, that divestment in fossil fuels, uh, particularly if we start to include oil and gas. And I'm just curious uh, as to um, your uh, response to that, uh, to that issue that's raised by responsible investors that they may not have uh, easy substitutes mm. to put that investment in. Mm. Um, yeah, well, it, uh, um, I, it's, I think it's natural that it's a political in initiative behind uh, the exclusion of, for instance, coal and the development of the ethical guidelines uh, for the fund. Uh, I wouldn't expect Norges Bank or, uh, or the fund to be those who suggest that kind of uh, new guidelines uh, for the fund. So that is not so surprising. But it is right that one of the arguments against um, divesting from oil, oil, oil and gas and replace it with renewables is that there are not that many projects to actually invest in. But we have a small fraction or portion of the fund who are, uh, who are part of developing these uh, markets. So I think that could change in um, some few years. Uh, let's hope we, we really need, you know, huge investments in renewables, especially in developing countries. Hi, my name is Robert. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, so uh, as I understand it, your sovereign wealth fund has now the policy that you don't invest in coal or major coal companies? That was the parliament decided okay. just uh, a week ago. Okay. So presumably the decision was taken because of, of the emissions. Now, of course, um, coal, oil, and gas do different things. but. I'm just brainstorming here and thinking uh, out into the future. Uh, as you know, much of the world's um, electricity is, is generated by coal, which is very cheap. Um, but it, let's suppose that this campaign succeeds and we move towards a, a low, get, get onto a, a low carbon pathway. Then 50 years from now or so, we're generating, if we've succeeded, we're generating electricity from, uh, from clean sources, from renewables. Um, right now, the, the baseline forecasts are we, we won't get more than 15% from, say, wind and solar in, in any reasonable time frame. But if we succeed, then at that point, uh, electric vehicles would become feasible. And at that point, we could begin to think about uh, uh, seriously reducing oil as well. So I guess my question is on the level of Statoil. Has Statoil um, uh, begun to seriously think about a transition to a post-carbon economy and, and fundamental transition of its business? Yeah. Um. Well, I think they could be a bit more forward lean. Mm -hmm. um, they are investing in windmills, uh, in not that big scale. 
Um, but I think that they are really um, uh, discussing their new strategy and how they should develop their company. Uh, it's, we don't have that many examples that an oil and gas producer, you know, it, it changes. It hasn't happened yet, no. no. <laughs> but Statoil could be the first one. That would be nice. Um, well, I think they understand more and more. They are more and more aware of um, uh, the situation and uh, following it very closely. They are now part of the six oil and gas producing companies in Europe that ask for uh, a carbon tax. Of course, one of, uh, because gas is a less emitter than oil, that would benefit Statoil the first decades. Um, but then, of course, uh, they have to they have to transform. Okay, thank you. Yeah. politics of a sovereign wealth fund. Alberta set out on the same journey that Norway took, and yet the, the temptation for politicians to put their hand in the cookie jar in times when oil prices drop down, when there's a demand for higher wages, just all of the demands on politicians from a country that would like you to spend more to provide services, particularly when oil prices fluctuate. How has Norway resisted the temptation to reach into that capital fund and use it to meet current needs in a way that Alberta and Saskatchewan, by the way, which set out to do the same thing in Canada, have not managed to do. Any ideas? Yeah, well, I mean, um, well, at first, um, how do I explain this? Um, the revenues that are, uh, it, was, it was not that many billions to put into the fund. So, um, that discussion uh, has been ongoing, but now the real return from the fund is so large that it's not possible to uh, avoid overheating of the economy and use 4% every year. So in fact, we are uh, lower than 4% when we look into the average over years. So the, the fund has now grown uh, and the the, the challenge is now to explain why we can't use the real return estimated to 4%. Um, not because of the reduction of the fund, or, um, but because it would overheat the Norwegian uh, economy. So, but I've, I've been in, you know, in the front line explaining uh, why we shouldn't spend uh, all the revenues uh, from the fund. I think people understand that quite well, but it's always very hard to explain why we, we can't just use one more billion. Right. One more, it must be possible. So that is, yeah, but that's the job of a finance minister. It's to look sad. <laughs> it's not possible, no. <laughs> I really enjoyed, you know, spending all this money during the financial crisis. That was, that was really very fun. Because then, yeah, because then it was very easy to explain the advantages of having this uh, fund and uh, the fiscal uh, rule connected to it. Because then it was possible to use, yeah, we had all the muscles that we needed and all the uh, money that we needed to fight unemployment. Well, we need more finance ministers like you in Canada. If you're looking to immigrate, we, um, listen, <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to come here. And as I said, if you like that, come back again tomorrow from 1 to 5, and you'll hear uh, her and five others talking about this broader question of the politics and effectiveness of carbon pricing. So thank you. Thank you very much.